Now let's consider a very deep question in development economics, namely, how persistent are the forces which shape prosperity? In other words, if your country is prosperous today, does this imply your country was probably prosperous also hundreds of years ago? You can think of this investigation as looking more closely at the role of geography in economic development, and also updating some of the results found in Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. Of course, look at Alex's video on that book. I'll be drawing a good deal on this excellent paper available online. I recommend you go to the source and read the whole thing. One thing those authors do is they take one measure of current prosperity, namely the log of 2005 per capita income, and they're going to ask what predicts that measure of prosperity. As explanatory variables, they use some important geographic features, namely absolute latitude or distance from the equator, percentage of land area in the tropics of a country, whether that country is landlocked, and also whether that country is an island. If you take those together in a well-specified model of economic growth, the geographic factors would appear to explain about 44% of the contemporary variation in the log of per capita income. In other words, geography really does matter. And of those variables, absolute latitude matters the most. There's another interesting paper by Olsen and Hibbs cited here. They make some changes in the analysis. They exclude countries settled by recent migrants. For instance, that would include, say, New Zealand. And they find that geography then explains about 55% of current prosperity even more. If we look only at the old world, geography then would appear to explain about 64% of the variation in current prosperity. Throughout these papers, in general, we are finding that geography explains more than biology. So, for instance, if you consider Jared Diamond's argument about the importance of domesticable animals for subsequent economic growth, that seems to matter less than where a country or region is located. A common metric of success in earlier times is population density, and we're going to look at population density in the year 1500 as a measure of success. Why population density? Well, for one thing, it may be easier to measure than real wages, but also consider in earlier times the world may have been in some kind of Malthusian equilibrium. That is, if a country or region was doing well, that would mean more people would exist, but it wouldn't necessarily mean higher real wages. So if we're looking at population density in the year 1500, a very important predictor of that is a variable called years since agricultural transition, namely how long ago did that region make the transition to regular settled agriculture. Another way of putting this is that having had a head start many years earlier still seems to be making a difference. Another predictor of early economic development, namely population density in the year 1500, is a variable called state history. For how long has a region had a history of a well-developed centralized state? What's pictured here, by the way, is the Salisbury Cathedral in England, which is home to one of the original copies of the Magna Carta. Another important paper in this literature is by Komen, Easterly, and Gong, and they ask the question in their title, Was the wealth of nations determined in 1000 BC? They find some fairly startling results. One is that technology adoption in the year 1500 predicts prosperity today and the level of technology today fairly well. They find even that technology adoption in the year 1000 BC has some explanatory power for technology, ad technology adoption and prosperity today. This is again suggesting that the idea of a head start really matters. The papers in this literature also find that what matters most is not the current geography of a country, but rather the geography of the country where the settlers came from. For instance, pictured here is New Zealand. A lot of the settlers of New Zealand came from England. 
what predicts the economic prosperity of New Zealand is not necessarily the current geography of New Zealand, but rather the older geography of the settlers of New Zealand, namely the English. This is again reflecting the theme of the distant past really mattering. These results are all intriguing, but it's much harder to know what to make of them. In particular, which forces channel these early effects? Does it have to do fundamentally with culture? For instance, once a nation or region has a successful culture, the success may in some manner perpetuate itself over time. That tends to be my preferred explanation. Other writers have considered the possible role of genetics in creating persistence and prosperity over time. We may end up considering that in an entirely separate video. Could it be some other factor? For instance, if your region was doing well early on, that gave you a source of political advantage, which then perhaps was used to take resources from others, which would both help you and to some extent keep them down. Maybe so, but in any case, this all awaits much further investigation. Just to repeat our key reading here, it's an article called How Deep Are the Roots of Economic Development? In addition to the other pieces mentioned, I also recommend Chanda and Putterman, Early Starts, Reversals, and Catch-Up in the Process of Economic Development.